Welcome to the Milestones in Redness series and our discussion of scleral buckle. I'm Dr. Timothy Murray, your host for this discussion. And today we will explore the history of scleral buckling in the United States through the individual perspectives of four outstanding vitreoretinal surgeons. They will share their experiences, which have collectively shaped our understanding of this procedure. But first, a brief historical background. Retinal detachment repair with scleral buckling became possible with an understanding of the pathophysiology of this condition, an ability to comprehensively examine the retina, the development of techniques and instrumentation to form a retina pexy, and the development of elements to indent the retina. Jules Gonan's focus on the localization and closure of retinal breaks in the early 1900s changed the landscape and established our understanding of the treatment of retinal detachment and its repair. Initially, full thickness scleral resection was used and then refined to lamellar scleral resection in 1949. Ernst Custodis conceived and developed an exaplant to produce a scleral buckling effect without scleral resection or foreshortening. He reported his results in 515 consecutive patients and remarkably achieved an 83.3% success rate in his report in 1956 using a polyvial explant and diathermy without subretinal fluid drainage. Charles Scapins in the United States developed the binocular indirect ophthalmoscope that revolutionized retinal examination and enhanced the preoperative and intraoperative localization of retinal pathology. Harvey Linkoff promoted the advantage of cryoretinopexy over diathermy, focused on advanced needle technology for scleral suturing placement, and identified the greater operative risk of drainage of subretinal fluid. Early proponents of scleral buckling in the United States were Taylor Smith at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary and Drs. Norton, Curtin, and Gass at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. Robert Mockamer's development and early reporting of PARS plane of vitrectomy in 1971 first at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute and then at the Duke University, established a trend away from scleral buckling as a single surgical procedure. With that, let me introduce my distinguished panelists and colleagues, Dr. Gary Abrams, Dr. Buzz Krieger, Dr. Mike Lambert, and Dr. Pat Wilkinson. Doctors, thank you for joining us today on Milestones in Retina, focused on scleral buckling. Dr. Krieger, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about when your residency and fellowship started and what your buckling experience was during your early training? Yeah, well, I began my residency in 1964, I think. Anyway, uh, in those days, uh, the fellows, we didn't have fellows. There, there weren't any fellows, at least in UCLA where I was. and. Uh, the residents all did scleral buckles, uh, and we were assisted by the, the faculty, most of whom did scleral buckling procedures, even though they were not trained to do that. Anyway, uh, we went through. I went through that whole uh, experience, then took my fellowship in Boston with Taylor Smith, and I was actually a, an ophthalmic pathology fellow, uh, but Taylor was extremely busy in uh, retina surgery, and he did over 300 buckles that year, and I basically learned my, my whole uh, scleral buckling experience from him. Then I came back to UCLA on the faculty, and by that time, retinal detachment surgery had kind of become a specialty in, in its own right. I took over the uh, retina division at that time in, I think, 1972. So Gary, can you, uh, Dr. Abrams, tell us a little bit about how your introduction to scleral buckling and retina started? I was a resident in Milwaukee. I started in 1973 and 
Tom Auberg was the chief of the retina service there and a veteran retina specialist and a veteran uh, scleral buckler. He had done his residency at Mass Eye and Ear, so he had had some introduction to uh, retinal detachment surgery there where they used uh, solid uh, implants with uh, scleral dissection. And then he had gone to Miami where they used exoplants and uh, Victor Curtin mostly used uh, sponges with exoplants. And uh, so Tom had uh, sort of uh, blended the two techniques and he used solid silicone, usually ba in most instances a, a band and a tire. Uh, and, uh, uh, but he, he did exoplants. He did not do uh, uh, scleral dissection uh, implants. And as a resident, uh, I was able to scrub on, I think, 64 retinal detachment procedures, most of them with Tom, a few with some of the other people. Then I went to Miami where I was a fellow, and uh, of course the dominant person in, in scleral buckling was uh, Victor Curtin, and Victor was just a master. Uh, Victor was, was very precise, very demanding, and uh, made sure that you, if you were going to work with him, you had to do it just right. And uh, now Victor, as I said, mostly used uh, uh, silica, uh, uh, the uh, sponges, silastic sponges, uh, as exoplants. But I also took a whole lot from uh, what I'd learned from Tom Auberg. So, so I, I, I blended those techniques. And I think that's what most of us do. We, we learn from a number of people and we see a lot of different techniques and we blend sort of what we do. So that, that was my background and that's the way I learned to do scleral buckling. So Dr. Lambert, you came from a more military focused background into your training. Could you tell us a little bit about how that went? I uh, was a pilot before I went to med school and stayed in the service. When I applied for the residency, uh, it, it, the only one that I could apply for was at Wilford Hall Medical Center, uh, which was the only ophthalmology program in the Air Force. Um, Dave Shacklett was the chairman at that point in time, and he was a retina person trained in buckles, not in vitrectomies. So for the first three months, um, I, I became interested in retina fairly quickly, and um, he uh, allowed me to do buckles um, until, uh, well, for the whole residency, of course, but Jack separately arrived about three months later from uh, Dr. Mockermer's program and brought in um, the visc and the acutome and uh, added the vitrectomy to our repertoire. And it was a really great training experience because both of them were really uh, good teachers and uh, allowed us to do many things. I, uh, I think I'd finished uh, 40 vitrectomies doing myself by the time I graduated from the residency. Um, and a, a ton of buckles. I don't even know how many, but uh, generally we were using a 240 band and a three by five sponge for most things and uh, other buckle 276s, 281s and, and the like. So Dr. Wilkinson, take me through your early training. I uh, was a resident at Wilmer starting in 67. Uh, we had two uh, of the charter members of the Retina Society on the faculty, Bob Welch and Harold Pierce. They were they approached detachments uh, quite a bit differently, but they, this was clearly pre-vitectomy day. And uh, Dr. Pierce did a fair number of uh, scleral dissections, uh, as Gary mentioned, and uh, Bob Welch did none. Bob used a lot more sponges than, uh, than Dr. Pierce. Uh, we, I scrubbed in on countless <laughs> cases. Uh, Dr. Pierce made us wear the indirect scope during the entire case, uh, even though we rarely used it. Uh, I guess it was part of a ritual. But I, as a resident, uh, probably did one scleral buckle perhaps uh, on a resident case. I was then lucky enough to go down to Bascom Palmer and. Uh, this, was, again, was pre-vitrectomy days. I scrubbed uh, on a few early vitrectomies with Robert Mockamer, but these were mostly uh, hemorrhagic cases in diabetic patients. But And I agree with Gary. I, the majority of buckles I scrubbed in were with Victor Curtin, but I also 
again, being very lucky, uh, did many buckles with uh, Don Gass and also with uh, Ed Norton. Don approached things very simply with, he would just run a band around the eye and anchor it with a single suture in each quadrant. Uh, Dr. Norton was left with uh, mostly re-ops, these horrible cases and which he would usually employ a, a very broad, high buckle. It seems like an incredibly exciting time for all of you, right at sort of the transition point between buckle, vitrectomy, and, and, and the interplay of both of those surgical you know, procedures. So Dr. Krieger, I think you had some unique experiences early in the way that retinopexy was performed and some of the needle technology development. Could you talk to us a little bit about how, how you saw things change from early in your training kind of rapidly? Yeah, well, I got into it at a time when uh, there were no retractomies and uh, the only option was some form of sclerobuckling technique. And in the early, in the late sixties, you had diathermy and that was about it for the retinopexy. It wasn't until a little bit later that cryotherapy actually became practical and useful. Uh, we did have cryo machines, but they were great big blunderbuss things and nobody actually used them. But it wasn't until Harvey Linkoff and uh, others in that field really reinvented the episcleral sclerobuckling procedure. And two of the things that facilitated it, or three of the things, were good sutures that you could now put into the sclera without penetrating it, cryotherapy, which you could use to treat the break without destroying the sclera, and three were th sponges. Uh, sponges were invented by, basically, by Harvey Linkoff and produced, uh, you know, industrially at that time. Uh, episcleral buckles had been invented a long time ago, even before that. Um, in the 1949, Custodes started using episcleral implants and he reported superb results with non-drainage episcleral procedures that were basically like Harvey's, only he had to use diathermy and he had to use this other material for the, for the buckling procedure. And it was so toxic that they would erode, cause all sorts of trouble, and they kind of fell out of favor. But Harvey reinvented that. And a lot of that technology then proceeded to inform surgeons later on to be able to get away from dissecting the sclera, putting in diathermy, and weakening it, instead using uh, cryotherapy, using episcleral bites. All of that was possible because of the invention of this uh, in the mid-70s. Before that, it was just dissect the sclera, put in diathermy, use an implant, and that was it. So, Dr. Abrams, the, the spatulated needles seem to make a major um, advance in terms of the ability to place a suture with much more safety in the hands of less experienced surgeons. Um, how did you feel that you approached suture placement at that time? And then what did you use as a determination as to whether you would drain or not drain? And then when you would drain, could you take us through what that procedure would look like? When I came along, uh, we were already using uh, spatula needles. Uh, but they were a cutting uh, spatula needle. In, in, in other words, the tip of the needle was a cutting needle, a triangular uh, cutting needle, and the, then the body just behind the tip turned into a spatula needle. So it's very sharp uh, and uh, it would glide through the uh, tissue quite well. In fact, in my brain, every time I put in a suture, I would hear Victor Curtin say, pick and glide, pick and glide. And that's exactly what I would try to do. I'm sure Pat remembers that. As far as drainage, you know, when I came along, uh, we drained uh, both at, at, at Miami and at uh, Milwaukee. Uh, we drained the majority of cases. They didn't like to leave any significant subretinal fluid. And uh, 
we would use a, a direct drainage technique in which we'd do a scleral cut down with a uh, usually a 57 blade. Uh, we'd expose the uh, uh, choroid. We would then gap, in other words, retract the edges of the uh, of the uh, little cut down with uh, a diathermy, and uh, then uh, we would uh, put a little. We'd inspect the uh, uh, bed of the choroid. We would then apply a little diathermy to the uh, to the choroid. Once we were sure where there were no no vessels there, after the uh, little diathermy applied, we would perforate with a 30 gauge needle, and it was a it was a pretty safe drainage technique. There's a lot of ways to drain subretinal fluid. Uh, I think you'll find people find what they like the best, and that's what they that's what they use. Dr. Lambert, were you a strong proponent of drainage procedures, or did you try to avoid that? And what would critically influence your decision? Um, I was a drainer for sure. Um, after training with everyone that had come through Robert's uh, program. Um, I would do exactly what Gary just described um, and uh, cauterize right before I put in the uh, small needle and drain. And I drained almost every case that I there was a potential to drain. And did you have concerns relating to bleeding with the drainage? And where would you like to place your drainage um, component? I would always cauterize in the area you, that you could see well enough to, to know that you're actually cauterizing you know, choroid, and then uh, just make the hole right in that position. That very few, fortunately, bleeds, and we'd cauterize immediately if we did bring the pressure up. But um, that worked very well. I think once you develop a technique that works, you don't want to change. So, Dr. Wilkinson, um, there had been a whole series of publications looking at non-drainage procedures and really good outcomes as early as Custodes' report. So can you give us your insight on, on how you approach drainage and were you aggressive with drainage or did you try not to drain eyes and, and how did that influence your surgical approach? I was a drainer and I agree with Gary uh, in terms of his uh, methodology. I used a 64 blade for what it's worth. I think there, there probably was some debate about whether you should make the scleral incision uh, perpendicular to the choroid or, or shelve it so it would have a valve-like effect when you finished. But uh, we in, I've always inspected the choroid with the indirect lens. If you get real close, it uh, works as a magnifier and then lightly cauterized the choroid. And I used a uh, one of those diathermy pins, penetrating diathermy pin that Buzz mentioned, it was blunt. It would usually kind of pop. It was. It was. I had never attached anything. Just, uh, just the pin itself, and used that uh, as, a, as a drainage device uh, throughout my career. I never sutured the sclera unless it was not covered by the buckle. But I attempted to. Uh, perform the sclerotomy in a site where the, the buckle would cover it after drainage. Dr. Krieger, you know, I think all of us understand the key to uh, surgical repair of the retina is close the break. But to do that, you have to be able to see the break. And you, I think, were right at the time when there were some rapid advances in indirect ophthalmoscopy and a big focus on retinal drawings. Can you tell us what it, what the workup for the patient before was? You know, SCAPE has developed the uh, binocular indirect uh, in the 50s. And similarly in England, uh, the Fison was developing a binocular indirect. And that really transformed how people could do sclerobuckling procedures. Because not only could you see the breaks ahead of time in the clinic, but you could translate that directly into the operating room and see the breaks just like you saw them in the clinic. So you could find them both in both instances. So the binocular indirect changed the whole game and made the, the success rate so much better. So Dr. Abrams, could you comment um, on where drawings were for you preoperatively and their use intraoperatively? 
the retinal drawing was your map to what you were going to do. Uh, it identified where the pathology was. It, it, the, I always felt the key was to get a good idea of the anterior posterior location of the break and, it's, and, the, and the location of the break in relation to the blood vessels. So I would, I would try to accurately draw in where the blood vessels were and then I would try to put the, uh, have the breaks very well localized in relation to the blood vessels. When I got to surgery, I always knew exactly where everything was because, you know, I, I'd already gone through the thinking on it. I already knew, had a good idea of where I was going to drain because I had already had a good plan on what I was going to do. And my drawing was my making my plan for my surgery. Uh, it was an interesting time, uh, very different from today. All the patients were admitted to the hospital. And uh, so they would be admitted to the hospital usually the day before surgery. And uh, uh, so in the evening before surgery, the, uh, everybody would go in and draw the retina. And so, so the poor patient would, you know, usually get, you know, three people would come in and draw, draw his or her retina. And uh, that was just was traditional. We always did it. Dr. Wilkinson, if, if um, you could take us through a little bit of how drawings evolved through your career and at the same time, give us some idea of what happened to the patients when they were admitted, what their procedures were like and when they were discharged. Uh, in Miami, there was much less tendency to, uh, to keep people in the hospital, but they invariably stayed uh, 24 to 48 hours uh, post-operatively. I think the drawings, uh, and particularly as has been emphasized, the, uh, it's really critical to identify the, the breaks as well as some structure nearby because strange things happen uh, between your examination before surgery and during surgery. Somebody can do something to the cornea. There, there are lots of things that can happen. Ironically, Dr. Pierce's cases, sometimes the retina would settle out so much with the bilateral patching that breaks were much harder to find. I think the comment about bilateral patching is, is interesting because I think many of our younger vitro-retinal surgeons um, have virtually no experience with bilateral patching. So, um, Dr. Wilkinson, can you take us through the theory behind that and, and why that was used? Well, if you reduce the eye movements, uh, the retina will settle and uh, settle dramatically. And, and in some cases, I've, uh, I've been a genuine proponent of bilateral patching for many years, but usually for a vitreous hemorrhage because uh, these days the resident will run for ultrasound to try to determine uh, whether there's a detachment and also whether, whether there's a break. And, uh, even an expert can cannot do this reliably with an acute uh, vitreous detachment. And, and uh, if these people are patched in about more than half the cases, you can see the upper periphery uh, where most breaks are uh, within 24 hours. So I think patching is fundamental. And uh, there have been a lot written about intraocular currents of Robert Mockham or certainly an early proponent of study of uh, intraocular currents and the, uh, the reduced motion of the eye with bilateral patching uh, uh, has a tremendous influence on a, on a detachment. I don't think it's really been studied as thoroughly uh, as it might be. There, there have been some models proposed, uh, laboratory models, but even those uh, leave some questions unanswered. I go back far enough that we didn't have gas. We didn't have anything other than just the scleral buckle. And uh, bilateral patching was frequently used postoperatively to get the retina to settle down on the buckle that had already been created. So it was a very common technique. It had its downside because people got DVTs and all sorts of things from it, but it was still a technique that was used quite commonly uh, and very effectively. Dr. Krieger, um, the comment to me that, that's interesting too is, is the, 
really rapid focus on, on ultrasound. And I think all of us would agree that for sclerobuckling, the status of the vitreous is really critical. Um, could you take us through how the vitreous got evaluated early and, and, and your thoughts on the importance of that? Well, uh, again, if you go back to the 70s, uh, uh, Scapins and his group were talking about very detailed examinations of the vitreous with the three mirror contact lens. They have many papers written on that about how it, you know, how it behaves and how it interacts with retinal breaks and so on and so forth. And then ultrasound came along and kind of didn't surplant that, surely, but assisted in getting our better understanding of it. And so I think that all of those techniques, you know, made our assessment preoperatively a lot more, not more accurate, but more, uh, more pointed. And then looking at those eyes now, do you feel that the status of the vitreous is important to push you toward one procedure or another? Definitely. You know, the vitreous is not, doesn't behave the same in every eye. If you think about it, you know, why is PVD extremely common in older age group and retinal breaks are not very common? You know, the, everybody should get a retinal break if we, our understanding of PVD is totally correct. Well, it's not. The vitreous it doesn't adhere to the retina in a regular way around the whole vitreous base. It has anomalous projections posteriorly, and that's where the breaks occur. So evaluating the vitreous and looking at it and seeing how it moves with respect to the breaks tells you a lot about where the vitreous base is. Uh, that's, that's useful not only in sclerobuckling, but also in vitrectomy. So Dr. Abrams, there's been a lot of interest now as we move through technology to go to um, swept source and spectral domain OCT. Do you feel there's a role for those um, tests in preoperative assessment for patients undergoing surgical procedures? You know, years ago, uh, you know, when I first got into retina, I re yeah, I, I, knew the, I knew the importance of, of the vitreous and vitreous detachment and all of this, but you know, I, I didn't really pay so much attention to it. You know, I'd find the brakes and I'd all that, and I'd buckle the brakes and all that. Uh, you know, as, as things have evolved, I think knowing the vitreous relationships is really is much more important. And uh, I started really getting into this probably in the 80s. I remember uh, I started, when I'd make my drawings, I would also make a, th a, a three-dimensional drawing in which I would uh, do a cross, a draw in a cross-section of the eye and sh try to show the vitreous relationship to the retinal breaks. So basically, I think if a patient does not have a PVD, generally a scleral buckle is going to be better than a primary vitrectomy. Um, in the UK st uh, study, which there were 15 centers in which they uh, looked at the uh, method of management of retinal detachment. They had about 13% of the eyes that were managed with primary scleral buckle alone, while the balance were managed with mostly vitrectomy, vitrectomy without a scleral buckle. I think only 5% of their eyes had, had vitrectomy with scleral buckle. The rest of them had just vitrectomy alone with, with gas and endo laser. I, I talked uh, to some of the principals in that study, and uh, they said that the vast majority of the patients that had a primary scleral buckle were eyes that did not have a PVD. They were younger patients that had lattice-related round hole retinal detachments that did not have a PVD. You can determine that if you're unsure if they've got a PVD, you can determine that by doing an ultrasound. I, I'm sorry, by doing OCT. Uh, sometimes it's best to also get an OCT of the disc as well as of the macula. You can usually tell when you do an OCT of the macula, but you can be even more, more certain if you do an OCT of the disc. And so uh, if we've got any question of whether there's PVD, PVD or not, we get an OCT on the patient, and uh, that will tell us pretty much definitively if there's a PVD present or not. 
Mike, leading us forward a little bit, what about the, the supplementation of buccal procedures as you move to air? Um, we, we used a combo uh, with gas as well, but um, the, we were using gas very early, um, air and uh, all of the gases, uh, as we discussed earlier, um, we uh, were able to obtain them um, long before they were uh, readily available. Yeah, so the approach to, to assistance in the operating room, we'll all appreciate, had a whole different FDA component and evaluation. I think all of us brought things into the OR um, that would be much more difficult to bring in at that level of understanding now. Dr. Wilkinson, um, Dr. Norton had, um, and Dr. Gass and Dr. Curtin all had some very famous say, sayings, and Dr. Curtin had one around the use of, of gas. Do you, do you recall that? Oh, very well. Victor would frequently say, don't despair, there's always air. And uh, we, uh, they were widely fooling around, experimenting with the use of gases. Dr. Norton published a very, didn't publish, but he studied a small series where he was simply training and putting gas in and uh, treating the break with no buckle. And uh, I don't think the success rate was sufficient to uh, satisfy him. But I, th I was just, again, very lucky to be around when gas began to be employed very, very commonly. The most common situation by far, in my experience, was to deal with uh, uh, fish-mouthing horseshoe break, usually a big uh, superior break, and you'd drain a bunch of fluid, and the break would just get higher and higher and due to the circumferential indentation of that buckle. and. Uh, Gas would save you uh, many, many times in such a situation. Um, Dr. Wilkinson, when did that transition into um, same-day admission, outpatient surgery, and discharge? And what do you think that role has played? Well, it's been a, a fundamental role. It's been a cultural role. I think it uh, probably varies from institution to institution. I can remember Don Gass visiting as a visiting professor at Wilmer, and uh, we had a bunch of patients, post-operative patients, just uh, waiting around uh, for the, just to, to heal, as it were. And he was puzzled why we hadn't sent all these people home, and all the residents were puzzled too. Once he once he explained that it wouldn't make any difference, so uh, I think. A lot comes with your personal confidence of uh, of how you have, have uh, dealt with these cases in the past and your comfort level with letting them go. Uh, but our culture has changed sufficiently now that uh, uh, I think it's more or less mandated that these people leave the hospital of ASAP. And your anesthetic approach moved from general to a local procedure, I'd assume. I. Uh, became involved with using more general very, very quickly just because it was, uh, you're much more capable of moving from case to case. Uh, we did not have anesthesia standby for for several years, and uh, we just would, would sedate them with a Valium or something like that and, uh, and use a local. Uh, again, the culture evolved, and I'm not even sure uh, when, what date the, uh, the anesthesia people became an invaluable part of the uh, sedation and, and watching over these patients. But uh, for many years, we, we had so not, uh, no such, uh, such help from anesthesia. It's interesting because um, I also had that opportunity. So my anesthesia attending it and their training teams are always surprised um, they say, I have a different level of comfort with uh, patient sedation than a lot of the younger surgeons, and many of them have never had the opportunity to sedate their own patients or to monitor their own patients. Dr. Krieger, what, what did you see as that evolution um, in outpatient surgery and um, local anesthesia? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing that changed the game was the introduction of Marcaine long-acting retrobulbar anesthesia 
made it possible to do very complicated sclerobuckling procedures without having to re-inject and have the anesthesia wear off and so on and so forth. Furthermore, it made the post-operative interval much, much more comfortable for the patient. So patients didn't end up with nausea, vomiting, and all the problems that it, that uh, came with uh, with the sedation or, uh, or with the opioids. So you didn't have to medicate people in the post-operative period. Therefore, they could go home. And so it made that whole transition much easier on the patient. And then bringing me back to anesthesia with Dr. Abrams, I can remember how precise you were about your draping for patients going into a surgical procedure, um, especially in those patients that were going to have general anesthesia in an extended case. Um, do you think that we're more comfortable now moving quickly, or do you think our case times have shortened? Um, what do you think has allowed us to manage these, these patients um, differently now than we did maybe two decades ago? We're much more likely to use uh, 41, 42 band on, on a case uh, than, than we once were. Uh, it's much faster, much easier, uh, much less traumatic to put, on, put that on than, than when you're putting on a very large uh, uh, tire. Uh, on the eye, and and when I certainly when I was training, uh, we were using much larger buckles than uh, than than certainly we do uh, today. I think in general, uh, we're we're faster, we're more efficient than we were at one time, be it scleral buckle or be it uh, vitrectomy, and uh, you know I think that's it's been an evolution. I think the expectation is that we move a little faster and, and more efficiently than, than at one time. So that brings me back a little bit to you, Dr. Krieger. I can remember that um, initially you had to custom cut an implant to be used for a scleral buckle. Um, that had evolved, of course, by the time that I got into my training program. Can you tell me what that was like? I think most of our younger surgeons have never <laughs> seen that approach. Well, it was, it was an adventure. Uh, you have to take one of the, the silicone came in little hemispheres. There were also some strips and there were encircling bands and so forth. But for the most part, it was a hemisphere. And you had to cut that in such a way that you made a tire out of it. And the hemisphere was so thick that it was too bulky to use it like that. So you actually had to take a knife, a, 15, a 57 or a 15 blade, and carve it down to where it was much less bulky in order to get what amounts to like a 276 tire now or a 280 tire now. So there was a lot more of that kind of stuff that had to go on when I first started. But by the time I finished my fellowship, Myra had come up with all sorts of different shaped implants. and. There, the intention was to get the implant to fit the pathology rather than the other way around. Uh, it wasn't just one size fits all. And I think that was a major improvement in things. But uh, even with that so-called primitive technique, my mentor, Taylor Smith, was, I reviewed all of his cases and using diathermy, average width of 10 millimeter implant, he got virtually 90% of his uh, primary detachments reattached with one operation. And that's about what people like to see now. So, and, and I think for many of our younger surgeons, they're using a standardized encircling element like Dr. Abrams had said, and then supplementing that as needed, often without the use of gas, more going toward vitrectomy. Dr. Wilkinson, you got to operate with Dr. Gas and Dr. Curtin, who had similar but very different approaches. Could you give us an idea of what um, a surgical procedure with Dr. Gass was like? Because it was quite unique for, for our younger doctors. Well, he was uh, very, very quick. And the real challenge as a fellow was, was to uh, you arrive ahead of time and do as much as you could do before he showed up. But he, when, he, when he arrived, uh, he would put a band, I think it was a 41 band, 
around the eye and anchor it in each quadrant with a single suture and uh, usually no segmental component at all and just drain and that was it. And these cases were exceptionally brief and uh, they worked very well. He experimented with using a, a so-called Aruga suture, which was uh, just an encircling a big suture of gut that would uh, that would erode. And the, the few patients I saw that had this would describe a characteristic uh, ping or something that they knew something had happened the day that uh, that, that buckle uh, broke, as it were. But again, I think that worked pretty well if you had the uh, retina reattached and a good chorioretinal adhesion. The other thing Dr. Gass would often do is uh, he'd put the band around and then he would, any place if he thought maybe a break wasn't totally uh, 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 closed, he would, he would stuff a sponge underneath the uh, band. He wouldn't suture it. He'd just stuff the sponge under the uh, under the band without without any uh, anchoring of the uh, of the uh, sponge at all, and uh, darned if it would usually work. I was always I, I I never had the nerve to put the sponge under without uh, anchoring it with a uh, with a uh, mattress suture, but Dr. Gass he would just stuff it under and it would usually work. What was the surgical procedure with with Dr. Curtin like? He was a very precise man. His standard buckle was a four millimeter round sponge. That's what he used on probably, I'll bet he used it on 90% of his cases. An encircling procedure with a round four millimeter sponge. Actually, that's the element that Victor put in in, in one of the cases I was there. And, he was allowing the fellow to assist and he wasn't happy with the localization. So what I really remember was Victor turning away from the operating field and kicking the wall. So, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at that and said, you know, the world really has changed a little bit in terms of how we interact with our, with our fellows. So that was a memorable moment for me, for me also. So Dr. Abrams, I, um, I love the fact that um, operative report dictations play a major role in explaining surgical procedures. And um, you had shared an, a, a dictation of an operative report of a cryoretinopexy. And I thought that would be an excellent lead into um, unexpected events that happen associated with scleral buckling. Could you share that with us? Probably the biggest, worst complication I've ever seen of a scleral buckling procedure was rupture of the globe by the cryo probe uh, during the cryopexy. And uh, it, it happened uh, in one of my cases. Uh, fortunately, it was the fellow that did it, and not me. Uh, but uh, the uh, cryo probe uh, 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 ruptured the sclera. And uh, I remember, I remember the sudden collapse of the eye, and uh, I also remember the sinking feeling I had when this happened. It turned out that, that one of my colleagues at the time had uh, the same thing had happened to him at, at one time, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, fellows was telling me the story of uh, when, uh, when this had happened to my colleague, he di dictated the operative report. And in the operative report, he said, uh, during the cryopexy procedure, the tip of the cryoprobe presented in the eye with unusual clarity. And I thought that was such a, uh, a uh, wonderful way to describe <laughs> probably the worst complication you can have with a scleral buckle. So, Dr. Krieger, what about your experience with complications or concerns of scleral buckling over time? Did you see those change, or, or were there ways to address them? Yeah, the character of them changed a lot. Um, the first four or five years of my being on the faculty, I helped all the residents do scleral buckles. The residents actually did the buckles. We didn't have fellows. And so I saw a lot of complications. And uh, one of the biggest ones was perforations. And so I made them stop doing intrascleral bites because that's where it always happened. 
and I made them make little mini flaps, like a little flap in front and a little flap in back, so that they could see how deep they were in the sclera and they could pass the sutures through it. And once we did that, it was a lot simpler. That complication uh, number went down significantly. And in fact, I, start, I adopted that technique and I've used it ever since. The drainage problem persists. It's always there. That's the most crucial time and that's where people, when they get into trouble, have the most trouble bailing themselves out. Fortunately now, whereas you couldn't do this when we didn't have a tractomy, now you can do a vitrectomy and, and fix that. Even right at the same time, if you get an incarceration of retina or if you get a you know a major intraocular hemorrhage or something like that, that is a more immediately fixable problem than it used to be before we had vitrectomy techniques. Or before vitrectomy was really popular as a technique for retinal detachment surgery. Remember, that didn't happen until several years after vitrectomy was devised. Nobody thought of doing a, you know, a primary detachment with vitrectomy for several years until, until Randy Del Campo, uh, Randy Campo came out with his original series on, on the, you know, purposely taking care of retinal detachments, primarily with vitrectomy. So, Dr. Lambert, what were your thoughts on on the evolution of buccal, and how did concerns with scleral buccal move you more to buccal vitrectomy, for example, or vitrectomy alone? I pretty much stuck with uh, using scleral buccals for a long time, and uh, was using vitrectomy for you know very complicated cases, PVR and complicated diabetics and that sort of thing. Uh, but over time, began doing more and more vitrectomies, like most people have. Uh, but my practice changed as well, and so um, I, I mainly saw PVR and, and complicated diabetics and the like, uh, and, and started uh, not being referred the, uh, the regular routine detachments. My partners would take care of those. Dr. Krieger, what are your thoughts on on that combination of of buccal to vitrectomy, and and why we moved in that direction? I think that. You know, you're confronted with a specific eye that has the specific pathology, and you have to judge, make the judgment as to what's the very best mechanical way to get these retinal breaks closed and keep them closed with the fewest number of complications or side effects. And that's a whole spectrum of things that, you know, you, a simple, you know, one break quadratic detachment may be ideal for a pneumatic or a localized sponge or something like that, and a patient with multiple breaks and a lot of vitreous pathology is ideal to have a the combination approach. So I don't think one size fits all. I think it's a mistake to look at retinal surgery as, you know, there's one operation you should do and all the rest don't exist. I think the, the fuller your toolbox, the better you, job you do for your patients. So, Dr. Evans, what I find interesting is that, you know, I, I spend time telling my fellows that what they're training in now and what techniques and what instrumentation may be so different five or 10 or 15 years from now. So could you comment a little bit on how those technology advances have impacted your approach to buckle or vitrectomy? Yeah, I think the introduction of small gauge uh, vitrectomy has made, uh, really has impacted management of uh, scleral buccal because uh, it's so much safer uh, and easier to uh, do a primary retinal detachment with uh, vitrectomy using small gauge vitrectomy and, and uh, valve cannulas than it was when we were using 20 gauge uh, fluid you know, gushing out of the eye when you when you remove the vitrectomy instrument. You've got so much more control over the eye. You're much less, in a fakic patient, you're much less likely to damage the lens using a small gauge uh, vitrectomy. So I think that's been, in my estimation, the biggest factor movement to uh, vitrectomy for uh, uh, primary scleral buckle. Also wide field viewing, where you can... Uh, uh, you know, you can depression and and uh, uh, using a biome with, uh, de, with scleral depression, you can easily see peripheral retinal breaks. You can easily see the aura serrata uh, 
it's 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 really made it so much so much easier to do that. And, and I think the ease of surgery, the ability to to easily see the breaks at surgery has been one of the biggest factors in movement from uh, scleral buckle being the major method of management of primary retinal detachment to movement to vitrectomy. I think there's certain eyes that are going to do better with with scleral buckle than than vitrectomy. And I think that group are the ones that do not have a PVD. These are younger patients in general that have lattice with round holes in lattice with uh, without a PVD. And those are, I think that group probably should be managed with a, uh, a scleral buckle. Uh, the, in general, I think younger patients uh, that have clear lenses probably are a good idea. To, uh, you know, a, a scleral buckle is gonna leave them with a clear crystalline, crystalline lens. Uh, good chance they're gonna get progression of cataract uh, with, a, uh, with a vitrectomy. You know, I still think that there's there's going to still be a place for scleral buckle, though clearly the the movement has been made to vitrectomy, and uh, that isn't going to change. That's going to that's going to persist. I just think people need to learn how to do a scler a good scleral buckling operation because you're going to need it in certain eyes that are going to do better with a scleral buckle. Dr. Wilkinson, what are patients that you think really are ideal for, for buckling? I mean, one of the things I've heard you discuss is um, potentially di uh, dialysis patients who need to have surgical repair. Do you have any um, focus on those patients that really are almost mandatory in your mind to consider a buckle for? The other co relatively common entity that we haven't discussed is an inferior temporal dialysis. Those uh, usually occur in young people with no PVD, and I think they should be uh, buckled. And I, I agree with what everybody said about uh, the importance of training vitreoretinal retinal fellows. I've been impressed with the fallacy of the, this, the large group of people that apparently buckle and uh, and do a vitrectomy at the same time, and they routinely slap this band around the eye with absolutely no comprehension of, of where the vitreous base may be. And there are very major variations in the posterior extent of the vitreous base, and that needs to be included in the in the buckle. If you're going to buckle anything, you, you need to buckle the uh, uh, the posterior extension of the vitreous base, which is frequently where these breaks occur. So uh, uh, in answer to your question, Tim, I think that the dialysis and the uh, common lattice uh, detachments, particularly in high myopes, in which a PVD has not occurred. So I, I think really it, it, it is kind of interesting to see a procedure that had remarkably good success rates um, even 50 plus years ago, um, kind of move out of, of favor um, at many of our, our major institutions. So um, Buzz, give us a little insight in, in how do we continue to incorporate buckling as a surgical procedure that we train our residents and fellows for in, in this kind of evolving time. Any thoughts? Our fellows all learn to do scleral buckles. We, we train them to do it. The problem that, from the faculty point of view, is that it's difficult to do that. It's hard to train people to do buckles. It's time consuming. It takes, you gotta be with them in the operating room. You gotta really kind of mother hen them through many of the, the, the technical troubles that they run into. Nevertheless, I think it's still really worthy to do that. So as long as I'm around, we're going to continue to keep uh, training patients to do, uh, our fellows to do scleral buckles. I think, on the other hand, the economic realities of the world are really pressing on these guys when they finish their fellowship. You know, many places won't let people do scleral buckles in an outpatient operating room because they take too much time, they don't get uh, reimbursed. Uh, 
with a scleral buckle, you need to have a surgical assistant who knows what they're doing. You don't need that with a vitrectomy anymore and a recite. So there are a lot of factors that push these guys away from uh, maintaining any kind of competence in scleral buckling. So I'm, I'm interested too in, in sort of understanding how do we convey to a younger generation the success rate of this procedure? It seems like we've almost um, lost that historical perspective. And I do think it also brings up the difficulties in comparing surgeon to surgeon outcomes and procedure to procedure outcomes. I'm not so pessimistic on this. Ed Ryan is, has really led the charge in, uh, in, uh, the, in trying to keep the idea of the importance of the scleral buckle alive. And, and Ed did, Ed, uh, was the force behind this, uh, the PRO study that's been uh, uh, recently published. And the PRO study has shown that uh, uh, scleral buckle uh, is uh, almost in every way was more effective and more successful than vitrectomy alone. Uh, but they didn't find a lot of difference between vitrectomy and scleral buckle between uh, between scleral buckle alone and vitrectomy scleral buckle, but both were superior to, uh, I think the success rate with re the single surgery reattachment rate uh, with vitrectomy alone was uh, about 83%. And both scleral buckle alone and vitrectomy and scleral buckle were like 93 and 91% or something right, right in that, that area. I think people are aware that this is an important area. And so I think a, a lot of the programs are teaching scleral buckle. Our fellows come out, they know how to do a scleral buckle and they're using, I think they're pretty confident in doing a scleral buckle when they finish their fellowship. And I, Buzz said the same thing. I mean, I, I think there's still a lot of fellowships that are still teaching scleral buckle. There are a few that don't. And uh, I, I think that's a problem. But uh, I think, you know, I think I, I'm not so pessimistic. I think I think there there's a knowledge that it's it's still a, an important procedure, and I think it's I think it will continue on in appropriate cases. Thank you, Dr. Abrams. I think that is a good point for us to end on. I believe that this group would agree that scleral buckling as a foundational procedure changed the landscape of retinal surgery and has saved vision for millions of patients. While the advent of vitrectomy, along with other diagnostic and treatment options, have given rise to novel approaches that may limit scleral buckling as a primary procedure, many retina experts still see enormous value in this procedure, especially for complex and selected primary cases of retinal detachment. And with that, I would like to thank my panel Drs. Gary Abrams, Buzz Krieger, Mike Lambert, and Pat Wilkinson for joining me. Doctors, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and experiences on scleral buckling. I'm Dr. Tim Murray. Please join us next time for another discussion on milestones in retina.